Hey guys and welcome to a very exciting video indeed. Today, literally this morning, um, I experienced 1.35 a.m. first drop, which is the third book in the Fazbear Fright series. <laughs> Pentology, I guess you could call it. Now, since then, uh, I've only read one of the stories. It's pretty good, and that's the one that we're going to go through today, which is, surprisingly, 1.35 a.m. Now, I really like this story. It's... The ending is quite predictable, I think. Like, there wasn't much else that could really happen in this story. The ending was quite predictable, but um, overall, it was a good plot, and I, I quite liked it. Anyway, I, yeah, it's like all the other stories. It's very original, and I've never really heard the, the kind of plot before, so it's a good one. It's good. So uh, let's begin. I'm going to go through the story, uh, and then I'm going to tell you what I thought of it. Um, remember there are spoilers ahead, um, that's just an obvious thing really, if you if you want to read the book for yourself, I highly suggest that you do, um, go and read the book for yourself, uh, you can get it on, on, uh, what is this, what is this, <laughs> I forgot what it's called, uh, the Kindle app, you could get it on the Kindle app, or you could of course get it, um, paperback, or Audible, Audible, uh, that is, I'm not sponsored though, anyway, without further ado, let's get into it. So basically, we are we are introduced to the main character of the story, who is called Delilah. Okay, and um, she lives in an apartment, uh, and she lives like next door to this this woman called Mary, uh, who always sings these really annoying songs. She's she's a weird character. Uh, she's always singing songs and waking up Delilah. Um, but Delilah is is like she finds it hard to sleep and. She's always late for work and, and stuff like that. And there are kind of a few reasons why. She she is a very tragic character, as I say in every story. Uh, she's a tragic character in the fact that uh, she lost her parents when she was only 11 years old. And so she was put into foster care. Uh, multiple foster carers wouldn't take her. Um, and even, like, her dad would have... Um, like forced timings you should do this at this time this at this time you have to um otherwise bad things would happen and then also she was divorced uh <laughs> so she felt even lonelier and she only has one friend now really um who we'll meet later one thing is that she she has a pathological hatred of alarm clocks um remember that uh, because alarm clocks are one prevalent thing in the story. So we kind of just get introduced to the character for now, nothing too special happens. We find out that she works at this pizzeria. Um, surprisingly, it's not Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, because later on she says, I don't know what Fazbear Entertainment is. So it's not Freddy's, okay? It's not Freddy's. Um, which, it's kind of like a red herring in that sense. But it's not Freddy's. Um, we learn that she's late because she overslept. Um, and so she's taking the afternoon shift um, later on, which is 2 to 10. Uh, at this time it had been about three days before she had gone exercise, so she decided before she goes on her shift, before she goes on her shift in like five hours or so, uh, she would go for, for a run or something. Uh, and then we meet the best friend, uh, who is called Harper. Uh, and she's, she's very optimistic I think um, she likes talking about spring she likes talking about like uh, like star signs a little bit uh, and she thinks every like number has a special meaning that connects to you um, which is interesting knowing how the book is called 135 a.m. she tries to stay optimistic here when she's doing her exercise she's like okay sure I've got a really bad job and I just got divorced and stuff but you know what at least I have this apartment uh, and at least I have, I'm, apparently she was the youngest, she was the youngest shift manager in the restaurant, which is pretty good. Um, and then she goes home and she thinks to herself, if only it was home, because she used to have a home when she was with, um, her husband Richard, um, but now she's just in this apartment. <laughs> you know, she's, she's got a depressing life, she's in this apartment next door to Mary who's singing her throat out I think singing her throat out that is not a saying and then we, we we get we find out that she's got like a cookie jar but um it's always empty 
And the way that she gets food is from her shifts. So one of the perks of working at the diner was she got two free meals every shift. That kept her pretty well fed. So, sorry. She's basically relying on her shift to give her food uh, in order to live in a way. So she's got a really bad life at the moment. She's in a really bad place. But you know what? She's working. She's getting through life slightly. But um, at least she's got a best friend next to her um, to keep her company, I guess. Okay, we, we're starting to get to the point where, um, you know, where the things start. Um, basically, she turns into this garage sale uh, in a different neighborhood. Um, it's quite a lot, it's like all of the houses are bigger, it's got nice trees, like everything is nice about this neighborhood. Uh, and she turns into a garage sale. Now, apparently she had a thing for garage sales, and it's because she was hooked on them since she was a teen. Um, maybe some uh, her therapist said that it was because uh, they gave glimpses into family life, and that's really only she, what she wanted. Later on in the story, she says she only wants love and support. And apparently she got all of her current furniture from garage sales, so that, sh that just shows how important they are to her. So she goes to this garage sale, um, and she meets... This woman doesn't have a name, but she has a, a chihuahua called Mumford. We don't really need to know that. Uh, so there's different kitchen appliances, there's games, puzzles, electronics, and clothes. And then she goes to the dolls area, and her gaze landed on a very suspicious doll. It had brown curly hair, big dark eyes, and plump pink cheeks. The doll looked almost exactly like the baby Delilah had envisioned having some day with Richard. So it's kind of weird. She goes over to this to this sale, this garage sale, and she sees a doll that looks like the kid that she wanted to have. Weird, huh? But that's not the only thing. She starts talking about how she wanted this baby with Richard, and her name would have been Emma. Well, surprisingly... The doll, which was actually electronic, is called Ella. Emma, Ella. So, going with the theory that the first story in each of the books are where the character is drawn to the pizzeria. Maybe not pizzeria, but they were drawn to an animatronic. So this animatronic, maybe it has like a, like a twisted disc, what, I forgot what they're called, sound illusion discs. Maybe it has one of them, uh, and they are they look like the baby in her head, and so she was drawn there. We don't know, but um, that's just a theory. But that is something important to note, that she wanted a baby called Emma that looked this way, and she found a doll after she was divorced, so she couldn't have the baby, that looked like the baby she wanted, and is called Ella, which is only basically one letter off. So she felt an odd connection with this doll, and so she bought it. Um, this is the part where it says that it's from Fazbear Entertainment, but uh, she doesn't know what Fazbear Entertainment is, so that confirms that the pizzeria that she works at um, isn't under the name of Fazbear Entertainment. And it kind of confirms that it's in the future, and we're seeing um, the scraps of Fazbear Entertainment um, from the 19th century, the 20th century. So it says on the on the manual that uh, Ella could do all sorts of things. She could keep time and serve as an alarm clock, manage appointments, keep track of lists, take photos, read stories, sing songs, and even serve drinks. So she can do all of these things, and she's like, whoa. And then she sees a note that says it can only work as an alarm clock. Um, but she still wants it. She still wants it. Um, even though it doesn't have stuff like pH levels and personality assessments. Uh, she was questioning why an old toy was so sophisticated. It's a bit like Fetch in the first story of the second book. Yeah, she wanted it, but seeing as it only had one function, she was like, you know what, I've been to plenty of, <laughs> of garage sales. Uh, I've done plenty of negotiating in my past. I will carry on. Uh, can you take off $15? Uh, and they shook hands on it. So she got it for fifteen dollars less than um, than what the price was. Brilliant. So she's got an alarm clock now. She can wake up at the appropriate time and not be late for work. So here's the part that gets weird. 
Um, she goes home and she puts Ella on the dressing table uh, and she thinks, okay, I'm going to set the alarm clock to 1.35pm, okay, because work starts at 2, uh, I live like literally 5 minutes away from work, um, if I wake up at 1.35am, uh, sorry, 1.35pm um, after a quick nap, then I can get dressed and go straight to work. So she sets it for 1.35 p.m. She goes to sleep and then she wakes up at 2.25 p.m. to her boss on the phone, essentially. Uh, and he says, you, you better be here in 15 minutes or you will never be here again. So something weird's going on. Maybe Ella just doesn't work at all. So you know what Delilah does? She just picks up Ella. She goes to work and she throws Ella in a dumpster. There's these three dumpsters outside her work and she just throws them in one of the open ones. She's had a pretty bad day, so she wants to get to sleep quickly so that the day's over. Um, so she goes to sleep quickly, good. But she ends up waking up really quickly too. 1.35 a.m. 1.35 a.m., that's the name of the book. Uh, clever one, Scott. <laughs> Pudding. Okay, yeah. I wonder how you came up with the name of this book. She's wondering what awoke her. Why is she up at 1.35 a.m.? Um, and then she looked at the clock and it was 1.36 because a minute had passed since then. Um, and then she was like, oh, I must have set the alarm for 1.35 a.m., not p.m. And so she's like, oops, I just threw Ella in the bin and didn't even think about that. So, um... So she tells Harper, her best friend, uh, and she was like, "Why did you throw it away? It could have been a collectible, and it could have been cool, and it actually functions. So why, why have you, why have you done this?" <laughs> She's always trying to tell her to uh, sell things before just throwing them away. Okay, that that's a good lifestyle to go by. You can tell Harper is a good person, a good friend, as well. Um, then she tells her. You said she looked like the baby you thought you were going to have. That's a pretty bizarre thing, don't you think? That you'd find a baby doll that looks like this imaginary baby. What if she's some kind of sign? You know I don't believe in signs. Maybe you should. So, uh, yeah. Harper does believe in these signs. Uh, I don't know if I've missed it, but there was something about... Harper once went through this period when she kept waking up at 3.33 a.m., and then she saw 333 everywhere for a couple months. Harper researched the number and found out it was some, court of sp uh, some sort of spiritual sign. So uh, Harper really believes in like signs and everything has a meaning, uh, which I kind of like. It's a kind of cool, cool character. So the next night, she goes to bed. Remember, Ella's not here, okay? But then she wakes up again at 1.35 a.m., exactly the same time as before. Um, and she, she realizes someone was whispering to her. She could hear whispering. Indecipherable, sibilant words coming from somewhere. Harper is right. Delilah should have looked for Ella. She should have checked. Not because Ella might have been valuable or that she was a sign, because apparently her alarm was still going off at 1.35 a.m., but Delilah hadn't had time before she went to work. She checked a day for sure. Uh, and then she says to herself, okay, I'm going in those dumpsters, I'm gonna look for Ella. Um, so she goes She goes to the dump dumpsters and basically a load of rambling goes on, uh, but she doesn't find She doesn't find her. It's kind of bothered at why twice in a row she's waking up, she's woken up at 1.35 a.m. but she she does think it's just a coincidence at first which is respectable I would think it was still co a coincidence um, then she does start questioning what uh, Harper was telling her maybe it is a spiritual sign maybe 135 is her spiritual sign so the next morning again she wakes up at 135 but this time she hears a scratching on the window um, and then she's like okay I'm done with this. I've woken up at 1.35 a.m. three times in a row. I'm gonna get out of my bed, I'm gonna go to the window, and I'm gonna open the curtains, and Ella's just gonna be sat there. But she wasn't. There was nobody outside the window. Nothing on the window. But she was sure that she heard the tapping sound. So what is happening here? 
Then she realised that uh, the dumpsters get emptied every Thursday. And today, well, tonight it's Wednesday. So the next night, this the dumpsters are going to go away. And so her problem's going to be solved. Ella's going to be completely gone because she's not going to be haunting her from the dumpsters. Um, that kind of backfires because the dumpsters, sure, they get emptied. But now, Ella's still here. But where is she? <laughs> she gets waking up at, she, oh my god, I say, I keep saying waking up. She keeps getting woken up at 1.35am. This time, there was something under her bed. Uh, she was scared to look, but she finally found the courage to shine the flashlight underneath. There was nothing there. And then she realises she's going insane, right? It's been four nights in a row where she's just woken up at 1.35am. It must be Ella. So she just wants to look for her now. She goes back in the dumpsters, she lifts loads of clothing up, even these diapers and stuff, <laughs> like all of this stuff in the dumpsters, and she just can't find Ella. It's just no use. So when she realises that this is a problem, this is too systematic um, for it to be a coincidence, she calls Harper up the next morning uh, and she tells her to come over because there's a problem. Uh, and she just says that, she just asks her if um, she got Ella out of the out of the dumpsters and she said no of course she didn't this story is very long by the way I didn't mention that at the start this is a very long story it takes a long time to go through it um, I'm only like halfway through and I've already been recording for 25 minutes um, brilliant I'm gonna love editing this she decides she's got a plan uh, and that plan is to go back to the garage sale and ask the owners about the doll okay um, but they weren't there nobody was home and she had a theory that it was because when people have garage sales, it's usually because they, they're they moving out and they want to sell all their stuff. Um, and so that's probably what happened. It isn't explained really, but I, I think that is what happened. Um, this family has gone now. So now she doesn't know really the origins of the doll or anything. She even looked Ella up on the internet. She tried loads of different search uh, terms like special Ella doll. Oh, unique Ella doll, haunted Ella doll, broken Ella doll, defective Ella doll. There was somebody called, there was somebody called Phineas online that was that was talking about he had lost his Ella doll or something. But that that's kind of a one-line thing. Like it doesn't continue in the story, and I'm very confused. Maybe we'll meet Phineas in another story. Don't know. And then it happens three more times. She wakes up at 1:35 a.m. And she's really bothered about this. Like, she feels like she's being watched at this point. She feels like Ella is definitely watching her. Um, and there was actually, there's quite a lot of just rambling here. So I, I'm going to skip quite a lot of this because not much of it is that useful. Okay, so we get to a point um, where she's been talking about the doll a lot. And she thinks that Mary, the next door neighbour who's always singing stupid songs, um, I think it's mentioned penguins, at this point, uh, what if Mary had the doll? So she goes over with uh, with some pie, and she's like, "Here, take the pie." Um, and she starts she starts singing about icebergs, I think. And she's like, "Mr. Lila, what a surprise!" And her her room is Japanese themed. Like what? To <laughs> then uh, Ella's no, not Ella. Sorry, Delilah is trying to to ask Mary about it, but she's like, how do I put this? Okay, so the other day I went to a second-hand garage sale, and then Mary's like, I hate second-hand stuff. I cannot stand it. I cannot stand that old trash. Uh, everything needs to be new. Uh, her, her apartment's very tidy as well, but Delilah really couldn't resist asking her about it. Like, she really, really thought that Mary had something to do with Ella. Maybe she was strolling her or something her or something uh she wanted to kind of fight her but then she was like hmm i bet she knows martial arts or something she's she's a very random person who knows very random things and has very random skills anyway uh delilah left without getting an answer uh, and so she thinks okay i'm gonna break in one day she goes to work and she meets this uh this like pick locker i guess i i forgot what they call uh, a private detective that's what it is a private detective hank uh, and he's like, he's like, what do you want? Uh, and she asks him to teach him, uh, she asks him to teach her uh, how to pick a lock. Uh, and it takes her 10 minutes, which is good. Um, 
and now she's breaking into Mary's apartment to try and find this Ella doll. She looks in the kitchen, she looks in the bathroom, she looks in the bedroom, there is absolutely nothing. That is literally what just what you need to know from this like five page review of uh, of this house. She even looked in in a toilet like you know when you know there's like the um, drainage part on top of the toilet you can take the lid off. Uh, it was clean in there and there was some secret st like stash in there um, but there wasn't the doll so uh, it's it's strange where is this doll? And at this point, it's been 13 nights. 13 nights. There's a funny little reference that says, uh, 12 nights of Ella. Maybe that'll be a game in the future. <laughs> uh, FNAF 12. But, uh, on the 13th night, she heard a massive alarm. Uh, and it sounded like she was... It was so loud that she dreamt she was being attacked by a huge bee. Uh, I don't understand that, but, um... Yeah, uh... She just got awoken by this massive alarm uh, that blasted through her ears. She's just kind of turning over and putting her face in the blanket and going, Why won't she leave me alone? And where is she? And she realises that not only is she being wake woken up at 1.35am, she's being terrorised by this doll. Okay? So it's not just waking her up. It is essentially attacking her, trying to kill her. Um, because she's so upset, she messages Harper again, or she calls Harper, uh, and she thinks she's gonna die. Uh, but she tells her to just go back to sleep. It's 1.35am every night. Just get more sleep. Uh, and she really doesn't believe what um, Delilah is saying. She even starts researching panic attacks, because she's thinking, okay, maybe I'm just going insane. Maybe there is no Ella. Maybe I'm just psychologically... Um, like traumatized I I'm getting I'm waking up I'm having panic attacks maybe it's that maybe I need to go to the, the psychiatrist or something uh, the next night she wakes up at 1 35 a.m. to the sound of a deadbolt being thrown back but her deadbolt was secure uh, her door was wide open uh, and she was like did I did I did I shut that before before I went to sleep or did someone open it she starts counting and when she gets to um, 273 sheep uh, she goes back to sleep and Harper meets up with her again, and she's like please just listen to me Maybe this entire thing is a subconscious thing. Maybe 135 is a number that's trying to tell you something um, But she doesn't care and she's like um, well, it's your funeral uh, And that's it we <laughs> Harper is kind of trying to tell her something uh, and she's not listening I I can understand why she's not listening really because She's you. It's like you don't get it, but um, maybe there is something interesting about 135. It's not just a time that she sets, and maybe actually I might look that up in a minute. This one's kind of creepy. I kind of got the creeps when I read this one. Uh, the next morning she woke up um, at 1:35 a.m. She could hear clawing, claw clawing. She could hear something crawling on her ceiling. That's kind of creepy to me. I oh, I get the creeps just thinking about it. But she took a flashlight, instantly looked up, there was nothing there. Okay, she's always expecting fi to find Ella just creeping around her house, but she's not there. At one point, she even, like, touches something very soft, and she said that Delilah, uh, and she said that Ella was soft, Ella's fingertips are soft, and she could feel something, and then she turns on the light, and nothing's there. So what is happening? Maybe she is going through psychological trauma. She isn't, I'll tell you that because this is a Five Nights at Freddy's story. She even tries moving to different places. She goes on uh, on the sofa and goes to sleep, but she finds her there. She goes in the bath and falls asleep, but she finds out that she's like in the pipes, in the tubes below her. And she's really just trying to get away from Ella at this point. She's trying to just get some good night's sleep, um, but she cannot. So it gets to the point where she thinks, I'm so stupid. What if I just stay awake? What if I just stay awake until 1.35am? Maybe she won't come for me then, because I'll be awake. So, what she does is she goes to work really early in the morning and she goes, I need you to put me on night shift, and so it happens. Uh, and then a lot of random stuff happens, and then here is the first night of her, of her first shift that goes through from like 10 to 2. Okay, it's 1.34am. 
Uh, Delilah stepped into the walk-in refrigerator to grab some cheese and some lettuce. For some reason, salads were popular tonight. She was bending over to reach for the cheddar when she heard an alarm going off in the kitchen. Rising up, she whacked her head on the shelf above her. She ignored the pain and looked at her watch. It was 1.35 a.m. She could hear something. She could hear something that, firstly, nobody else could hear. Nobody else could hear this. And where have we heard that before? We've heard that in Into the Pit and kind of Fetch. Nobody noticed Fetch apart from um, Greg. Uh, and of course, in Into the Pit, only, um, what's, his, what's he called? Oswald. Only Oswald could see the Spring Bonnie. So maybe it's the same with this. Maybe she can only see Ella. But she's hearing all these things and she's going insane and everybody in the restaurant is going, what are you doing? What are you... Ah! <laughs> like, everyone thinks she's going insane. So essentially, Ella still found her even though she was working at night in the pizzeria with her eyes wide open. It's kind of scaring her, but she tries again. And on the second night shift, um, she hadn't heard or sensed anything. She had seen something. She'd seen a flash of bright blue in the walk-in when Jackie opened the door. Jackie is one of the employees there. When she saw what she saw was she was saw oh my god. When she saw what she was sure was Ella coming out of the walk-in. Delilah screamed and pressed against Glenn. He didn't seem to mind that either, but yeah, blah blah blah. Um so yeah, it keeps happening every single night, even though she's wide awake. So it doesn't matter if she's asleep or not. It's just every 1.35am, um, this uh, this weird doll traumatises her. It happens again the next day, uh, and she uh, looks behind her, and Ella is just sat there on a stool. Um, and then she kind of looks away, and then looks back, and she's not there anymore. It kind of reminds me of Plush Trap. On the fifth shift, the diner was empty, uh, and she was like, what is it going to be tonight? And then she spotted something outside of the pizzeria, so she just ran out. She ran straight out. Um, she, like, broke a few glasses and, like, salt and pepper thingies, uh, salt and pepper pots. Uh, she broke them, uh, and then she ran out, and she just, and she didn't find Ella, and she just sat there and screamed outside. Um, and then, um, all of her, all of the other employees were like, it's okay, you're gonna be okay, it's fine. But then, her boss comes out, takes her in to his office, and says, I'm gonna let you go. Goodbye, you're fired. <laughs> okay, he can't deal with this anymore, he can't deal with us smashing pots and pans and going insane at 1.35 every night she's fired okay she doesn't have a job anymore so this stupid doll has just made her lose her job but I mean fair enough because the boss um, did say that uh, he's given her lots of chances which we have seen throughout the story I just haven't really read it read that much because it's not that important um, so she, of course she's trying different things so she goes to Delilah's house for, for a night oh my god did I say Delilah's house I meant Harper's house she goes to Harper's house one night uh, and Harper is just like okay put your clocks away put everything away you are not looking at when it's 1.35am um, but she still sees uh, or hears or senses Ella um, apparently a voice in her head says it's time at 1.35 a.m. Very creepy. That didn't work. So she tries to go as far away as possible. Uh, she goes to a motel because Ella wouldn't find her at a motel. She wouldn't expect her to be there. Uh, this is a really good quote. The sound crept through her sleep like a spider crawling through her synapses and leaving silken trails among her neuropath ways. Yet yeah, there, there was a creepy sound that woke her up at 1.35 a.m. again. Um, and she screams again. She all she really does in the story is scream and run away. Um, I don't blame her. Her room lights up and no one's there. Ella is not there anymore. She thinks she's on the roof, but um, it's like Ella's like invisible to her. Like where is Ella? We haven't seen her since um, she was thrown in the dumpster. Um, 
but we've sensed her a few times at 1.35 a.m. every single night or morning. Now she's in her car, she's going across a bridge, uh, 1.35 a.m. hits, and um, I just realised it is now 1.35 p.m. That's creepy. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, but um, that just put me off. That took me off guard. Um, anyway, yeah, she goes in a car this time. She's in a car. Ella isn't going to find me in a car. Suddenly, the back door slams. Like, it opens and then it slams. Uh, she expects to turn backwards to see Ella just sat there in the back. But she isn't there. No one's there. Then suddenly, something hits the roof of the car. Uh, that never gets explained. Um, and then she realises, uh, you know what, I've just got to find a hiding place in the daytime and hide there forever. So she sprints away, she's really upset at this point. What she does is she like throws away everything, like her purse and her phone, uh, because she thinks maybe Ella is connected to those things, that she's chasing them rather than her. But no, it's not true. Basically she finds this drainage pipe in a factory, uh, and she tries to hide in there, but then she, she realises she's hyperventilating. Uh, and she needs to escape and find somewhere else. She crawled back out uh, and she finds this empty abandoned construction site uh, and so she runs there and then she goes in this uh, in this site and there's a vent opening so she stacks things on top of each other to climb up to go into the vent uh, and she starts crawling and she sees that there's this da the vent goes downwards so she goes down there and I'm going to read you the last bit of the story. Aiming her head down into the chute-like space, she scooted forward, a little further, and a little further. Her flashlight slipped from a sweaty hand and clinked against the metal vent walls as it dropped down out of Delilah's reach. She heard it impact something with a sharp crack. It must have broken because, because the space went dark. Delilah's shoulders wedged her so tightly into the compact metal enclosure that she knew she'd finally found it. This was where Ella couldn't find her. No one would ever find her here. Trying to move just to be sure, she confirmed that she was stuck, completely and thoroughly stuck. Her breathing slowed. She relaxed. She couldn't move in any direction. She'd never have to run from Ella again. Now. That is the ending. I thought two, one of two things could have happened. Either she would just put herself in a place and get stuck forever and eventually die off, obviously, or she would just commit suicide and end it all. Um, I think this is the better ending of the two. Yeah, it's probably the better ending of the two. Um, <laughs> what do I think happened? Um, yeah, she was definitely just stuck in this vent she couldn't get out even if she tried um, but she's like you know what I'm stuck here but at least Ella can't get me um, but it's a very tragic story like every story in the Fazbear Fright franchise I can't believe Scott does it every single time the ending wasn't as good I don't think as other stories um, there have been some very good endings uh, this one wasn't as mind-blowing as the others but um it still gave me the chills at the end once I finished re reading it. Um, what did I think of the story? Generally, pretty good. Okay, it's a it's a good read. Um, it's kind of repetitive though. I think it just drags on too much, and it's not as eventful at the start. But um, it it was fine. I quite like the story. It definitely wasn't one of my favourites, but it was it was pretty good. Um, so what did you guys think of it? What theories do you have on it? Um, I, I do want to do a few videos covering 1.35am and all its theories and stuff. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed this video and um, hopefully it was helpful to you. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye!